we are uh, on Greenwich and Rectory Street. So I need you to use your imagination, all right? Mm -hmm. If this was uh, New Amsterdam back in the day, um, we'd be walking right along the edge of the river. Uh, the river would be like right here, you know, where... Um, and now it's parking. Yes. This is now battery parking. Um, he was trying to talk about how he wanted to have like humor in hip hop and rap and whatnot instead of just like being serious like the Germans. Stereotypically. <laughs> you know I'm half English, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's helpful. <laughs> All right, and we're also seeing pigeons. Uh, Mariel, is this your first, like, kind of real trip to New York City with mom? It is, isn't it? Sorta. Sorta. You know, it's like being able to walk around and stuff and, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. So, so this is fun. Yes? Yeah. Are we having fun? No. Yes. yes. Cool. All right, so, um, Russell Sorta. Uh, very like yay Dutch people and you know I'm half German so I understand anyone who's yay anything that's not German uh, <laughs> uh, but um, there's another historian he's actually a, an art historian which you said you were really into mm -hmm. art history um, he was at Williams College and the Clark and he's now at the University of Rochester his name is um, Christopher P. Hoyer, and I saw this really awesome lecture um, of his where he was talking about the old fort. And one of the people at the time who had to shelter in the old fort was complaining about how badly constructed this fort was. You know, it really wasn't uh, entirely completed. Um, and according to Hoyer, um, you know, the fort actually never got completed the entire time. When the British took over New Amsterdam, the fort also wasn't completed. So, um, as with most things, you know, you've got people who are very enthusiastic, um, who like to view things in one way, and then you have people who are like, hey, let's put the brakes on that. You know, here's some other evidence that maybe it's not entirely as, as idyllic as you thought it was. So, that is where we are walking to right now. We are walking to Battery Park. Mariel, why don't you talk more about your impressions of New York right now? Mm. We just got here. Mm. So, New York is sort of like... You know, that one city where uh, it's based like the entire world summarized. And uh, extremely diverse. I mean, you have little Chinatown, little Italy. You even have like some high fashion Indian stuff here and there. Like I literally saw like I don't know, like a boohoo sort of clothing store right next to like this really intricately designed Indian store that had like a uh, that uh, Middle Eastern lighting, you know? So I could tell that it was at least, at the very least, Middle Eastern. Which is really cool. I support that. Uh, And I guess there's also like, I believe that people have liberal tendencies on one spectrum and conservative tendencies on the other spectrum. Like people would mostly vary from like liberal in one side in like one problem and conservative and another problem. 
So personally, I would be like very liberal in immigration and letting people in. Of course, you need to like security checks and whatnot. Right. However, however, yeah. personally, I <laughs> personally, you know, I think it's really cool how diverse New York City is. Good. All right. So, um, the only reason why I stepped in the middle of this, we are, daughter, yeah. <laughs> we are now at the Battery, and this was the site of the original fort. Yeah. So, and the original fort, um, you know, again, was up against uh, the shoreline. So, you see all the way over there where the river is? camera all the way over there um the river was actually all the way up here and the fort was all the way up here yeah. so you can tell like how much um humans in new york have changed the environment here um they uh you know they put fill all around a lot all of this is built on fill um so originally you would be standing almost in water like about like a minute that way you'd be standing in water now the other thing i want you to imagine take away all of these buildings um imagine you know kind of this pristine river right here imagine a fort built of wood with palisades um kind of not very well constructed you know but it is the tallest building here so not that building not that building not that building but a fort right here that's the tallest building um and uh from what i've read um you know the island of manhattan specifically lower manhattan uh you know was actually it actually had hills um you know it had a huge pond so imagine this area you know very idyllic in terms of nature um you know, you know like the Windows XP wallpaper. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. You know, so you have a fort over there. With and like the, one building, which is like a woodlock fort. Yeah, huge woodlock fort. And then you have smaller houses along here. Um, but even in that environment, there is this idea of building a grid. So even, you know, with a shoddily built fort and smaller family homes, um, I think there was maybe about, uh, I'd have to check, but I think it's about 30 families um, who uh, moved here in 1624. Um, the original inhabitants of New Amsterdam were all employees of the Dutch West India Company. Yes, they were all employees. Well, the ones who were here voluntarily. The involuntary ones were enslaved by the yep. Dutch West India Company. Yep. Um, you know, so, but the ones who were here voluntarily were employees um, and they were of all different nationalities. Uh, you had, you know, not one exclusive religion represented, which is forward looking, um, you know, but in a few minutes, I, I'm going to show you what I think is actually probably one of the most important things about American history that nobody really talks about. Um, my guy, get my directions. So, alrighty. So we are at Broadway uh, and Battery Park. This is where Broadway begins, and this is the site of the original fort. So the original fort was actually right here. Um, it was up against the water. Mariel, if you can look that way, do you actually see the water right now? A little bit. Yeah. So the water is all the way down there. Originally it was all the way up here. This is the side of the fort. And this is now um, the National Museum of the American Indian, which I think is really neat awesome. historically. Yes, it is awesome. Um, one of the things that makes it awesome is Peter Stuyvesant, who was one of the, um, I think they call him the Directors General uh, of New Amsterdam, New Netherland. Um, one of the things that he did was um, 
he took uh, some soldiers from here in New Amsterdam, went all the way up to the lower uh, Hudson River Valley, and um, you know fought Native Americans there because they wanted to farm the land. The Native Americans were getting in the way, um, so that's what he decided he needed to do. Um, and again, there are certain things about you know this history of New Amsterdam, New Amsterdam and New Netherland that aren't really talked about, but are underrated. Yes, <laughs> historically in terms of importance, underrated. You know, they're not directly talked about, but I think it's really neat that uh, Smithsonian put the National Museum of the Native uh, of of the American Indian right here. It's uh, it's fitting. All right. I gotta look for my directions again. All right. All right, so we're heading near this hole of pigeons. Now, in order to carefully examine the pigeons, and get really close to them. I'm even angling it so that I'm even angling it so that I can get the pigeons real close. All right. Nature, beauty of nature, and it's such an urban environment also. There's a lone pigeon in its natural habitat. There is a man. This achievement of man, known to man, is to insert tiny cameras in these pigeons' eyes. Brain. Even though we're not nearly as as intelligent as a Homo sapien, they are still intelligent in the ways of technology. No, they didn't invent technology, but they are technology. They are cameras. The bourgeoisie invented the camera to charge them. To charge the city. <laughs> Full of fear. They watch. Da da da. Oh, sorry. Dedicated by the city of New York to. Robbie Wolf Ambrose, for whom the deep sea channel is named. Okay, that's cool. His vision, scientific knowledge, and the fragile courage ended in making New York the greatest part of the world. Yeah. Yeah, I think I said it right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Come here. All right. So. Um, I did tons of research, you know, because I'm a nerd and it's fun for me. Um, but I did not know about John Ambrose. So signs on street, on street walks really help. This is how I learn history. This is how lots of people learn history. They go, they visit, they read a sign. It's like, oh, all right, now I know. Um, John Ambrose, um, is, uh... He uh, helped to develop the deep sea channel uh, to New York Harbor, which improved the viability of the Port of New York, uh, making New York City the heart of commerce in the United States. Very big deal. The one thing that I think is really interesting, I'm reading his um, biography here, um, and he was forced to work at an early age. Yeah. So, um, you know. Hi. Like how Charles Dickens was forced to work in a factory at an early age. Yeah, he was he was born in 1838, and in the 19th century, they didn't have the laws that they have now against child labor, um, yeah. and uh, he was forced to work. So, um, you know, that says a lot that someone who you know experienced something really tragic like that in an early age overcame it 
and then help to make New York City the economic capital that it is. I think it's really cool. What do you think? Cool. Cool. All right. We're going to go find a map. Yeah. All right. So, um, Mariel, yeah. this is a map mm -hmm. of what was originally uh, New Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. This is the old fort. Um, you can see there's a windmill that's in all of the maps of what was New Amsterdam. Um, you can see up here, that's the river. Um, and again, we walked along, that was where we started. All right, so where we saw in Greenwich Street, that is that border right there. Um, yeah, so, and you can see, like, you know, the types of houses that, that are portrayed in these maps. Um, let's see, and then you can see how, you know, this kind of looks a little like a grid in a way, right? Yeah. You can see right here, this was a canal. Um, there's a subsidiary canal that was built. Um, you know, it was, uh, I, I've heard accounts where it's kind of less a canal for ships and more of a canal for refuse because humans have refuse when we live in places and we need to get rid of it. Anyway, um, so, uh, you know, this is, um, oh, <laughs> thank you, technical advisor. Um, so where we walked, we walked down Pearl Street, we walked down Bridge Street. Bridge Street, there was an actual bridge on Bridge Street. So you see where this canal is? There was an actual bridge right there. Um, now we're gonna move down this map right here this is the protective wall it goes all the way up you know where we started on Greenwich yeah you know before we start recording that is where that wall is all right. so you're getting an idea as to how big this colony actually was it wasn't actually physically very big yeah so the one thing that you need to know about New York um, is it was always a dense environment all right, so uh, this protective wall that I pointed out to you, um, that wall was built by enslaved people. Um, I can describe to you what that wall probably looked like from what I've read. Um, the wall was, it wasn't like, you know, brick and mortar. It was, um, you know, kind of a wooden barricade. Um, you know, it was there uh, I've heard different historians say it was there to keep out the English. Yeah, okay, sure. Um, you know, the fact that uh, Stuyvesant um, had gone up to the lower uh, Hudson River Valley, um, you know, with soldiers um, to attack Native American peoples, it was probably also there um, as a protective measure against Native American peoples traveling back down here and attacking the colony. Um, so, Mariel, mm -hmm. hey, hi, <laughs> I was just digging my, uh, umbrella in like the sand here, because there is actually sand and dirt and whatnot, <laughs> and there's even like sandy rocks too. Right. I don't think it's original to the site. <laughs> yeah. There, there's very little here that's original to the site unless you start digging down underground, which I think is really fascinating. This is one of, I think this is one of the youngest cities in the world um, where archaeology is a thing because it needs to be. And that's what I find fascinating about New York is it's layers. It's really cool like that. Um, yeah. It's like uh, if Venice decided to build more land instead of building more ships. Yeah. Actually, the... You don't want to yell over all that. All right. Um, if you look at how Venice, uh, you know, built its buildings, it basically, it put posts in, um, you know, it's kind of in this swampland, like this lagoon area. It put yeah. posts down there, and then it built buildings right on top of the posts. The posts calcified, 
and kind of became very rock-like or stone-like over time, which is fortunate. I don't know if they saw that coming, but it's really cool that it happened. Um, if you look at you know, the combination of fill out here and the way that they have put posts in the harbor, there are similarities with how fill was created because they would actually kind of, you know, have to secure that area where the fill was going into, you know. So there are some similarities in the construction of how they were able to expand um, the land out into the harbor and into the river. So yeah. that's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, so it's basically like a if Venice built like land instead of boats and ships or whatnot. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's actually a really good analogy. Um, one thing I need to tell you about the protective wall um, is, all right, you know where I was pointing. So on this side of the protective wall towards the left, that is where um, the employees of the Dutch West India Company were, you know, the director general was. Yep, over to that area. Now over, over to this area? Right. Now over here to the right, um, and we're going to talk about these enslaved people and how they petitioned the government for their freedom 130 years before the American Revolution. And, you know, I have, and so Mariel has, uh, two ancestors who fought in the American Revolution, both from Massachusetts, both militiamen, and I am impressed that 130 years before, um, you know, these people started to petition their government in England um, for their rights. Um, 130 years before that, enslaved people in New Amsterdam petitioned their government for their freedom. That is breathtaking to me. Um, so those enslaved people um, were given half freedom, and I'll go into more detail about that. They were also given land, but the land was outside of this protective wall. Um, and I've heard some historians say that is because uh, the Dutch are trying to create a buffer zone between the colony and Native Americans who might think about invading the colony. Um, you know, they also had to- Really, it's just discrimination, yeah. my personal opinion. Yeah, you, you see a lot of that in history. <laughs> we, you know, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice, but it is long. Yeah. So, um, we're going to walk a little bit up and see some more things, and I gotta find out where I am. All right, so while she's finding out where she is, I... I really have to show you, um, personally, when I build architecture, I build it digitally. As in, I play Minecraft. <laughs> so right here is Root Sprite. Now you see there's like an A here. And I believe that is an old wording for streets. It's Dutch for street. Yeah. Which Scott, I yeah. think is how it's pronounced, but yeah. I, I could be a little German in, in my pronunciation. My apologies in advance. So I'm just going to say it like an English way because I'm mostly English and I've never spoken German much as as much as like English. So this is Bruce Strait or Straits on basically like an English version of that and stuff like a professional Dutch thing and if you look over here there's not only like houses that vary in length but there's also gardens and farmlands and look at these gardens though these gardens might have been where some of the more elaborate elaborates and fancier people basically were and then there's like a and then there's like a couple of trees and they're like some smaller farmlands with some very small houses probably for the farmers because obviously they had to like have some sort of food source you know at least same food source because 
food shortages were a bit of a problem in New Amsterdam, believe it or not. Yep. So, they just had to have like a food source, at least from somewhere, at least from anywhere. Mario, hmm? did you know that part of Half Freedom, um, the enslaved people, um, you know, the, uh, the uh, man could have his freedom, his yeah. wife could have her freedom, their yeah. kids could not have their freedom, and part of uh, maintaining that freedom was growing food for the colony and they would have to give a tithe or a fee or however you want to phrase it a certain amount of produce that they grew to the colony every year in order to maintain their status of being free. So you have it. Food shortages solved at the expense of others. You know what I just found interesting? So right above Ma, there is a sign that says Shrine of Saint Elizabeth and Seti. First American born saint That's cool, isn't it? on eight states. And you see this, this sort of like concrete bricks, not necessarily like bricks as in the red bricks right over here, but these are like whiter bricks. Uh, not sure what the materials are because it could have been like pure concrete, you know. Because unlike the red bricks, these are like PA whites, but they still have like holes in them. Which, speaking from common sense, these holes could have like been some bubbles that would usually come arise when we're making concrete. Sure. Yeah. So here is a mass scheduled church entrance. This is an actual church, by the way. And you see right up at its sippy top. See that? That is an actual statue. That is the statue of the saint. What do you think about yeah, that? Yeah, the statue of a saint's god. Saints? Saints. Elizabeth and Seton. Saints Elizabeth and Seton. That's awesome. So, here... We have... Way newer buildings. These buildings weren't here, as well as the land. I mean, if you told me this was grass, <laughs> I... <laughs> Actually, where we're walking right now, Meryl, this is water. Yeah. That is the land. So we're on the other side. This is still water. Yeah. If you told me this is water, I would say BS because this is, this is like concrete stone sort of ground. This is not a liquid. But New York City always keeps innovating. Yep. And it's very persistent on doing so. Yep. And I think that's one of the reasons why it won't talk about like it's bad side of New Amsterdam past. Mainly due to facts that why focus and mourn on the past when you can focus on now? That's basically what they probably think. Now, I gotta tell you something, Mario. You were born in the suburbs of Atlanta, Georgia. You were born in DeKalb County. Yeah. Um, and we lived in South DeKalb uh, yeah. when you were born. Um, Atlanta was uh, one of the big cities of the Confederacy back in the day. And coming out of the Confederacy, um, it tried to adopt this motto of the city too busy to hate. Um, and Atlanta has some of this mentality of, well, let's, you know, get rid of some of these buildings and build new buildings and we'll build our way out of this. What do you think about that? Well, if you really want to learn from past, 
personally, I would keep those buildings as monuments. Let nobody inside. Or if you let people inside, make it into a museum. Because the only way to better ourselves is to learn from our past mistakes and not do them again. And you have to acknowledge it before you can learn from it. Um, let me ask you this. Yep. Uh, and then we got across the street. I'm going to ask you this real fast before we cross the street. All right. So we've talked about um, legalized enslavement. Mm -hmm. It started in New York, according to uh, City University of New York, in 1613, uh, when Jan Rodriguez, I think his name was, uh, you know, was forced uh, to work on the ship that carried him to New Amsterdam. So they start that as the start of legalized enslavement in New Amsterdam um, of African Americans. That's a whole other story. Anyway, um, so it starts in 1613. Um, you know, there is gradual emancipation that happens somewhere around 1827. Um, you know, but. Again, I don't want to yell over that for a second. All right, so you have more than 200 years um, of... I don't know what's happening. All right. So you have more than 200 years of legalized enslavement in New York State. Um, you have gradual emancipation um, that, you know, uh, the, the young people, um, you know, that had been enslaved still had to be indentured servants before, you know, having their freedom. Um, you had a slave market in New York City. Um, not for a long time, you know, relative to other cities in the Americas, but yes. it was here uh, in the 1700s under the English. Um, and in the 1840 census, you still had enslaved people listed as living in New York State on the 1840 census, even though New York State had passed laws against legalized enslavement. Um, after this, you have, um, you know, people in New York City talking about being sympathetic to the cause of the Confederacy. You have the draft riots. You have, um, you know, legalized discrimination, uh, you know, in terms of housing and redlining that still affects the values of African-American neighborhoods and African-American homes today. African-Americans have less generational wealth because of that. Um, what do you think about reparations, about repairing that damage economically? I believe that uh, it should be important to politicians but since politicians are mostly like I don't know uh, whites first of all and they're mostly like you know not much of New York City as the diversity of New York City and since we only had one African-American president Personally, I think we're on a good path to reparations, but it's not probably not going to happen much soon. Let me ask you this. What if New York State went first? Because it was one of the first states in the Union to have legalized enslavement in 1613. Yes, what, if, what if New York State passed reparations as New York State and set the tone for the rest of the country? I believe that it would be uh, I believe that would be profound and perfect. 
profoundly relieving to I believe that would be profound, profoundly relieving to most Americans. And and it would take loads of weight off of New York and Swirlers because they know they've gone on the right path for for like the 150th time, or whenever, or whatever sort of uh, total that New Yorkans have done good so far. Mm -hmm. Like all the good deeds that they've done uh, locally, governmentally, globally, nationally, etc, etc, etc. I believe New York State and New York City itself, especially, is a very progressive, diverse state. So it would make absolutely no sense to me to that for the New York governor to not allow that. So you, you think Governor Andrew Cuomo should come out in favor of reparations inside of New York State? Yes. And, and set the tone. And I believe that the mayor should be on his side as well and yeah. yada 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 well what what universal if uh, agreement. what if governor's governor cuomo's political opponent the republican says oh see there we go again there's the liberals you know this is critical race theory and you know they're they're just trying to make america you know this terrible place we're not racist what would you say to that person first of all if you don't approve of African Americans being people just as much as Caucasians, uh, Asians, Middle Easterns, all the races, gender identities, uh, males, females, transgender, like any other person, then yes, you are racist. Yeah. Well, let, let's say they're like, well, that's not my issue. I'm not a racist, but I don't think I should pay reparations. That happened, you know, years and years ago. I don't have anything to do with that. Well, if you try and forget about it, it'll probably come up again. That is a good point. So one of the arguments in favor of reparations would be really, you know, healing that wound and putting it in the rear view mirror. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I agree. And then. Personally, if anything, I believe uh, any change that goes towards a more positive future is good change. If that includes reparations for African Americans. I agree. All right, we're going to cross the street. Yeah. Good. Now, this is amazing, all right? Ronces Tavern, this Francis. national, yeah. Francis. No, I think you're right. Yeah. Francis Tavern, this national treasure has been listed on the National Register of Historic Places by the United States Department of the Interior circa 1719. Now, if you look at the next billboard we have here, after the American Revolutionary War on December 4th, 1783. General George Washington bade emotional farewell to his officers on a banquet held in the long room looking at the second floor of his tavern. Yellow brick walls. Samuel Fonsis, a West Indian innkeeper, was a perpetrator. Yeah. He later became Washington's chief steward. Francis, also an American patriot, was hosted secret meetings of the Sons of the and gave aid to American prisoners of war. The President's Building, purchased by the Sons of Revolution in 1904, was restored by them on the site and has since been maintained by them. Lake, provided by New York Community Trust, set 1976. All right, daughter, come here. Uh, who were the Sons of Liberty? 
The Sons of Liberty included Thomas Jefferson. I believe it might have included Samuel Adams. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it also included Joseph Warren. Um, and Maybe Benjamin Franklin. Yeah. Do you know who Joseph Warren was? One of the earliest presidents, I believe. Nope. He, he probably would have been, um, ah. but he got killed in the Battle of Bunker Hill. He was, uh, you know, really, he was one of the uh, really serious uh, founders, Sons of Liberty. Really took the revolution seriously. Um, he served in the Provincial Congress in uh, 1775 when it had to be moved to Watertown, Massachusetts. Um, in, you know, because they were anticipating military action that eventually happened in Lexington and Concord. Your ancestor, uh, Colonel Levi Brigham, um, you know, served in that Provincial Congress with Joseph Warren, uh, one of the Sons of Liberty, who died in the Battle of Bunker Hill. So you know. Cool. All right. So mom, can you tell me what place of New York City is this? All right, well, we are on uh, Pearl Street. Um, so we're getting close to 71 Pearl Street. I think we may be at 71 Pearl Street. Turn the camera around. I think it's this building right here. Um, but it's, it's definitely inside this block. This is the beginning of the first uh, city hall in New York. It was called the Stadtshaus. And again, I may be pronouncing this too much as a German. I apologize. Um, but uh, the Stadtshaus was huge. Um, it was built in 1641. It was there, um, you know, to adjudicate all different types of petitions. Um, and we are going to find our way to 85 Broad Street, uh, which also has um, some information about the Stadtshaus and in the public plaza and. We'll talk some more about what happened there and how really important that is to American history. It is an inflection point and I get goosebumps when I think about it and I don't understand why people don't talk about it. They really should talk about it more, mm. but um, let's walk. And now, this area is just a bakery and restaurants. <laughs> Le Pain Quotidien. Uh, I believe that's French. Most likely. All right, so logical deduction. I think that was 71 Pearl Street. This is 85 Broad Street. So this is all one big area. Um, and this was uh, the original city hall. Um, and they discovered this uh, because they were, you know, trying to build this area up. Um, it was one of uh, the areas of lower Manhattan that had been populated by people who were descended from some of the original settlers. It's my oh, understanding oh, guess anyway. What, guess what? what? I believe Little Italy is right over here. We'll check it out. Yeah. I'm a fan of Little Italy. Um, so. I mean, it looks very similar to like Venice and Milan. All right. We'll check it out. Um, but this is the site of the original city hall. So we're going to walk around. I'm going to try and find this map. I like signs on sidewalks. They're helpful. However, however, however. this has now been turned to a plaza. And specifically, there is a bike store right across from us. Or, or, it's, right there. or it's an art exhibit. It kind of looks like an art exhibit. Did you know? Yeah. in building this plaza that's how they found out city hall was here they were doing excavation work they came across um some archaeological remains i think of one of the original walls and they had to stop um and this is actually when the city hired its first archaeologist this happened in like the 1970s um you know and before the 1970s the city hadn't really thought in terms of archaeology and now it is and I think that's awesome. You know, again, I, one of the things that impresses me about New York is how many layers of history it has 
and how fast things change. And it needs to stay like that. That's part of what makes yeah. the city awesome. Yeah. 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 Here it is. This is a cistern from the 1700s. Look um, at that. It has like ferns, greenery, and everything. Yeah, it originally extended down to the water table, providing the inhabitants, um, in, providing for the inhabitants inside the block. So that is, you see, when, when they built this thing, they discovered things like this. Wow. You know, and they were like, hey, we need to hire an archaeologist. From that original es excavation. Wait, wait, I, I see something shiny over here. Hold on. Could that have been like some sort of like really smooth concrete or something like that? I think what this is, because I've read about this, I think this is um, when they were trying to build this building, they discovered one of the retaining walls of the original city hall. And I think that's what this is that we're looking at. I think this is one of the original walls of the actual city hall. Ah, this is... So this goes all the way back to 1641. So basically, concrete is one of the oldest man-made materials to oh, build. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you see the nature. Oh, I saw a vision up close. Look at that. Look at that, man. Alright, everyone, we are approaching... We are approaching what I believe to be the outer layer. I don't know. I'm not sure. We'll check. I mean, it has a pub called the Double War, which I don't know if this is a little bit but it looks kind of awesome. So. Yeah, it looks. Let's check it out. It looks at least a mix between Irish and Mexican. Italian. I'm seeing a Mexican flag. <laughs> it's uh, Irish yeah. and Mexican. Yeah, Irish, Mexican. This area is cool nonetheless. Mom? Yeah. What, what would you think our ancestors? Like Thomas Brigham, for example, would yes. think about this whole city hall being used as a plaza. Um, you know, the deal with your ancestors is uh, they hung out in Massachusetts. Um, I want to say, you know, maybe one generation after the American Revolution, then they started moving west. Yeah. Uh, so I think your ancestors would think this is pretty awesome. They are definitely of the American mindset of we gotta build, we gotta improve. You know, let's keep let's keep going. <laughs> let's not rest on our laurels. So I yeah. think that I think they think this is cool. Now, yeah. the other cool thing down here at our feet, I think I found it. Um, so yeah, so this is we have the old fort right there, and we are right here. This is 85 Broad Street. This is the site of the original um, city hall. And again, I told you, this was the original city hall was built in 1641. And in 1644, um, in 1644, there were 11 enslaved Africans uh, who petitioned their government for their freedom. And that probably happened right here on this spot where I'm standing. And I, it's 130 years before the American Revolution. It is one of the most visionary inflection points in terms of what it means for our country, what it means to be Americans, petitioning the government for our rights, specifically enslaved people petitioning the government for their freedom. They were only given half freedom in return should have been more uh, you know it got worse unfortunately before it got better um, and but it was a start but it was a start 
It was a very important start. Um, and I think that's probably a really good place to, uh, to end our video, you know? Um, I really think reparations is really important. I think we need to repair some of the history that happens uh, in this country. I mean, hey, she's a history nerd and she researches literal artifacts, literal like Metri in the history of like for Romans and whatnot for fun. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Yeah. This this is fun for me. Um, yeah. It's literally fun for her, and it could be like homework for most people. <laughs> uh, it's this it's, is probably what some people would have for like exams to, <laughs> at the very least, a community college or like maybe even UConn. Or maybe even Harvard or Yale. All right. Well, the thing that's important about history is it's about real people and the real achievements that they achieved and the real damage and the real harm that had been done to them. Yeah. So yeah. anything we can do to repair that harm helps us all move forward on a more equal footing. And that can only help. So yeah, she's smarter than to have bias. So. Thanks. Listen to her, all right? Bye. <laughs>